I'm honored to introduce the winner of the 2021 Gilder Lehrman Lincoln Prize, Professor David Reynolds. David is a Rhode Island native who received degrees from Amherst College in UC Berkeley. He's taught American literature and American studies at Northwestern University, Barnard College, New York University, Rutgers University, and Baruch College. Since 2006, he's been a professor at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York, where he teaches English and American studies. He is the author or editor of 16 books, and his books have won the Bancroft Prize, the Christian Goss Award, the Ambassador Book Award, and the Gustavus Myers Outstanding Book Award. And one of his books was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. His big book, Abe, Abraham Lincoln and His Times, is a beautifully written life of Lincoln, set in the cultural and social context of his time. The New York Times Book Review described it as a prodigious and lucidly rendered exposition of the character and thought of the 16th president as gleaned through the prism of the cultural and social forces swirling through America during his lifetime. The Wall Street Journal deemed it a marvelous cultural biography that captures Lincoln in all his historical fullness. Our jury noted that through innovative research, Reynolds evoked the settings that played key roles in Lincoln's life and his encyclopedic knowledge of America's religion, literature, humor, and politics allows him to populate Lincoln's nation in its rich and unprecedented detail. It is with great pleasure that I, on behalf of the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History, present the 2021 Gilder Lehrman Lincoln Prize to David Reynolds. Congratulations. Now I turn it over to Professor Reynolds to tell us about his book. Thank you so much, Valerie, for those kind remarks. And thanks to the Gilder Lehrman Institute for this wonderful recognition. Jim Baxter, Bob Giuliano, uh, Ed Ayers, and the others on the committee. Um, I, I truly appreciate it. And last year's winner, uh, Elizabeth Barron, who spoke so uh, wonderfully earlier about the mission uh, of uh, the Institute and its outreach to high schools. Uh, congratulations to her. Uh, in her explanation of her book. And background of my book, uh, Abe, I want to mention Lynn, Lynn Nesbitt at Janko and Nesbitt, who um, circulated a uh, book proposal uh, and one paragraph in it <laughs> on Lincoln caught the eye of uh, Scott Moyers at Penguin. And Scott and I discussed things and I realized I had a, you know, a book inside of me that had been kind of growing for years and years. And, Scott kind of pulled it out of me, and uh, thanks so much to Lynn and Scott, and thanks also to where I teach, the Graduate Center of City University of New York, uh, a stimulating uh, scholarly environment from the student cohort uh, to the faculty members to the administration. Thank you so much to CUNY, and particularly uh, to professors, uh, colleagues uh, in the history program. Um, James Oakes, biggest winner of the Lincoln Prize twice, <laughs> and uh, David Wallstriker, who uh, were kind enough to, to read my long manuscript when it was still on the screen, and you know, I couldn't believe it, and gave me such wonderful insights and edits and so forth. And I, outside of uh, CUNY, I want to thank uh, Douglas L. Wilson, a marvelous Lincoln scholar, and Mason Lawrence, a wonderful Americanist uh, who also read the manuscript. And uh, above all, my family who have stuck by me through thick and thin. And it was both a great challenge, but also great fun uh, to be writing my book while my wife, Suzanne uh, Malbantian Reynolds, uh, was working on her book on creativity and neuroscience and the humanities. And when my manuscript was finished, she, uh, Suzanne, sat down and very carefully read through chapter by chapter was just a, a wonderful commentator. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, in, in 18, I was gonna say that Walt Whitman uh, in his poem, his wonderful eulogy, uh, written out after the death of Lincoln, uh, when lilacs last in the dooryard bloom, uh, he describes uh, Lincoln as the great Western star uh, illuminating the landscape, the American landscape. And in a sense, uh, that's what Lincoln always was to me, um, this kind of uh, beautiful, wonderful star, but also a little bit removed um, and somewhat inaccessible. I didn't see him very well attached to his contemporary culture. And then I spent years thinking about that culture. After all, it was the greatest literary period um, in American 
literary history. Emerson, Thoreau, Melville, Hawthorne, Poe, uh, Emily Dickinson, Walt Whitman, and then you had such wonderful figures as uh, Frederick Douglass, Harry Beecher Stowe, um, of course there was John Brown, William Lloyd Garrison, and just so much going on. It's just such a wonderful period. And uh, Walt Whitman in 1856 um, fantasized about a president coming from across the Alleghenies from the West. Uh, at that time, Illinois was uh, considered the West. And he didn't know about Lincoln at all, but he said, some boatmen or raftsmen uh, in working men's uh, beard, bearded, shrewd, a working person, um, uh, honest, which, and, and Whitman said, I, I, I wish you would step across the Alleghenies and right into the White House. This was at the time of James Buchanan and uh, Franklin Pierce and so forth, and other inferior presidents. And lo and behold, four years later, here comes Abe. Uh, and he is sold as Abe, uh, the Illinois rail splitter, honest Abe, old Abe. And Lincoln didn't particularly like that name, nor did he like Mr. President. Or, or Mr. Lincoln or anything like that. He preferred Lincoln. But he did say, I know I was not going to get elected <laughs> without the image of, of Abe. Okay. And that's why I call my book Abe. Um, it's really about the intersection between him and basically what got him elected, um, which was his knowledge of his contemporary America. And Emerson said about Lincoln, he said, you know, uh, there's no hero in history who encompassed culture, uh, all ranges of culture, from the very highest to the lowest. On the high side, Lincoln could recite Shakespeare by the page and many other poets. Not to brag, just because these lines meant, meant something to him. And he liked body jokes and frontier humor and everything in between. <laughs> uh, sappy uh, parlor songs and so forth. So he really did bridge a whole range of of uh, of culture, and he strongly believed that people are uh, shaped by conditions, by their outside conditions, indelibly, indelibly shaped. But at the same time, he stated that he believed in the individual's capacity to shape, to in turn feed back into culture, and for the individual to shape it. And so my my book is really about that whole interchange between uh, him and his surrounding culture and how that guided him into the presidency and through the Civil War. And uh, it was a nation divided, of course, over slavery. And in that division, he uh, was compared often to Blondin. Blondin was the famous tightrope walker, Charles Blondin, who went back and forth across Ni Niagara Falls, no net, backwards, forwards, in chains, on stilts, pushing a wheelbarrow, carrying a man over. And many cartoons portrayed Lincoln as Blondin, and, and a few times he compared himself to Blondin. And people would say, can't you go faster on slavery? He said, listen, if Charles Blondin were going across Niagara, would you tell him to tilt this way or tilt that way, tilt to, to the left or to the right? I have to say, stay centered here. If I don't, yeah, some people will say I'm too slow, others will say I'm too fast. If I don't, something bad is going to happen. For example, we could lose one of the border states. If we lose Kentucky, we're going to lose everything. We're just going to lose everything. So I have to say, uh, stay centered. And he was also confronted with a culture that was turbulent, rowdy, um, and fragmented. Uh, he once called uh, America a mobocracy, mobocracy, and full of particularly white supremacist mobs that were uh, attacking African Americans and immigrants. Uh, and also abolitionists, and he really called for a strict respect of positive law in that case. And uh, also, he uh, it was a fragmented nation full of what we call isms, uh, such as spiritualism and uh, know nothing ism, and utopian socialism and free love and on and on and temperance main law ism. And he was very much aware of all these isms, but he said, and these were his his words. We have to concentrate on one ism. He, he used the word Douglasism, and Douglasism was the possible spread, the threatened spread of slavery to the West that was opened up by Stephen A. Douglas uh, when he called for popular sovereignty uh, in the Western territories. And Lincoln really put his foot down and said, 
we have to stop Douglasism, and that's what we have to concentrate on. And he did that so marvelously uh, throughout the Civil War. And finally, what was initially largely a war to preserve the Union, and as um, Liz was saying earlier, for deliverance, uh, became a, a war specifically to get rid of slavery, which fortunately Lincoln lived to see with the passage of the 13th Amendment. We had passed Congress um, uh, uh, just a few months before he, he was assassinated. So uh, he did live, and then he became the first uh, president to publicly endorse the vote for African Americans. So, um, and one thing that helped him a lot was poetry. He loved to love poetry. And on uh, April 9th, uh, 1865, when he was on a boat from um, Virginia to Washington, and that was the day Lee surrendered to Grant, and everyone on the boat was saying, in effect, mission accomplished, you know, this is great, we won. He preferred to read poetry for a few hours, and it was poetry about death. Poetry really spoke to him. He was thinking perhaps about the 750,000 or 800,000 people who died uh, in, in the Civil War. That's where his thoughts were. It wasn't so much about how great I am or how great the North is. It was really an outreach through poetry. And poetry is, after all, the most channeled, concentrated language. It really focuses feeling and meaning um, so wonderfully. And really his uh, greatest speeches are really prose poems. They're short, like Gettysburg Address, a little over 200 words, uh, second inaugural address, which is, you know, uh, 700 odd words. But they're so pithy and really poetic. And what lives uh, uh, with us today beside his example is his language, the better angels of our nature, uh, malice toward none, of the people, by the people, for the people. This is language that still survives. And in his honor, I guess, uh, since he loved poetry so much, I would like to recite the poem of Langston Hughes, the great Harlem Renaissance poet who in 1926, uh, shortly about four years after the Lincoln Memorial with his grand columns and his wonderful marble statue had opened, and Langston Hughes wrote this poem. It's called Washington Monument. Washington. Lincoln, Lincoln Monument, Washington. Let's go see old Abe sitting in the marble in the moonlight. Sitting lonely in the marble in the moonlight. Quiet for 10,000 centuries, old Abe. Quiet for a million, million years. Quiet and yet a voice forever against the timeless walls of time, all day, thank you.